The title of this presentation is Metabolic Engineering, Improving Therapeutic Outcomes of Hormonal Replacement Therapy. Before I start, I should give a short background and overview of hormones. As we age, some hormones decrease, but other hormones increase. So it's not basically replacing, but it's more modulation. In addition, hormones are signaling agents that coordinate our metabolism in each of our 37 trillion cells in the body. Hormones are oftentimes produced by specific organs, hormones such as insulin, thyroid, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, growth hormone, and many others. But it's usually these hormones which are basically replaced in terms of using hormonal replacement therapy. However, hormones are also produced internally in every cell in your body. Some of these hormones are those that increase inflammation. These would include cytokines and acosinoids. But the cell can also produce hormones that decrease inflammation. And these would include resolvents. So you have external hormones interacting with the cell surface to cause changes in metabolism. You have hormones being produced within the cell. They can also change cellular metabolism. So what are the goals of hormonal replacement therapy? Primarily to increase hormonal signaling levels of those hormones that decrease with aging to affect metabolism. However, hormonal replacement therapy will have no effect on the hormones that increase with aging. And if your goal is to achieve wellness, this requires a dynamic balance of all hormones, not just one group acting in a vacuum. So this actually now asks, proceeds on a different question. How do we define wellness? Well, here's a typical definition. If drugs treat the symptoms of chronic disease, then wellness must be simply the absence of symptoms of chronic disease. That's not a very good definition because it doesn't take into account it takes years for those symptoms of chronic disease to eventually arise and be seen as indicators of some illness taking place. Here are some other potential definitions of wellness. One might be, I'm just lucky. That's good for you, but very hard to transfer to someone else. Another potential definition might be, I have good genes. Again, good for you, but hard to translate to someone else. But here's another potential definition of wellness that basically has applicability, and it'd be the absence of insulin resistance. So again, exactly, what is insulin resistance? <clears throat> It's really a catch-all term that says your metabolism isn't working correctly. You can't look at a person to see if they have insulin resistance because 16% of normal weight individuals have severe insulin resistance. But the first physical indication that you have insulin resistance is usually the accumulation of abdominal fat or belly fat. And once you have insulin resistance, this becomes a gateway to many chronic diseases. What is the primary cause of insulin resistance? It's not a virus. It's not uh, an infection. It's a pro-inflammatory diet. So it means we have to define what a pro-inflammatory diet really is. <clears throat> it can be composed of or caused by excess nutrients, consuming excess calories, or excess carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, such as bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes, or excess consumption of simple sugars like glucose and fructose, or excess consumption of omega-6 fatty acids and palmitic acid. All of these will increase inflammation. But it also could have def deficient nutrients, lack of omega-3 fatty acids, and lack of polyphenols. These are the nutrients required to reduce inflammation. And it could also be an unbalanced protein to carbohydrate ratio. Any one of these three factors 
can give rise to a pro-inflammatory diet. And the more of these factors you have in your current lifestyle, the more inflammatory your diet is. Inflammation is a very, very complex subject. This was the cover of the major mass market magazine in the United States in 2004, talking about the secret killer, the surprising link between inflammation, heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. So you would think uh, from this cover, if we just stop inflammation, we'd have the secret to longevity. Unfortunately, inflammation, like metabolism, is not that simple. Because with inflammation, you need a zone. If you have too little of an inflammatory response, your body becomes a sitting target for microbes, and your injuries would never heal. But if you have too strong of an inflammatory response, the inflammation is not resolved or turned off, and the body now begins to attack itself. So to basically live a longer and better life, you need to basically maintain a zone of both inflammatory hormones and anti-inflammatory hormones. So here is our current understanding of inflammation. Inflammation, it causes damage. We know that. But resolution, or the turning off of inflammation, is the key to healing. Well, if inflammation causes damage, what controls healing? The answer is a little more complex. I term it the resolution response. And this occurs in every one of your 37 trillion cells. If you have an injury, you get acute inflammation. And you see a rise of inter internally in the cell of pro-inflammatory hormones, of cosinoids and cytokines. And this will keep on basically causing increasing damage unless the resolution response deeply embedded in your genes, is also activated. It's activated by inflammation. But now this resolution response is far more complex. First of all, you have to reduce the levels of those inflammatory uh, hormones, <coughs> then increase the levels of the anti-inflammatory hormones to resolve the inflammation, and then to basically increase the activation of the master switch of metabolism to repair the damage. And of all threes are working as a team, you get healing. And that's how the body is designed to work. So let's look at this resolution response in a little more detail. Healing is the key, but healing requires an on-demand resolution response to repair damaged tissue caused by inflammation. And the resolution response is a highly orchestrated series of both hormonal and epigenetic actions. But here's the key factor. Each step of the resolution response can be blocked by insulin resistance. And if the resolution response is blocked, your body cannot heal effectively. And the reason why this is so important because it's insulin resistance that disrupts your metabolism. This begs the question again, what exactly is metabolism? It's obviously how we convert food and energy, but it also controls your immune system. It controls the expression of your genes via epigenetics. It controls the ability of your tissue to regenerate. It controls your rate of aging. So you can see that metabolism is probably a lot more complex than many people believe. And here, basically, it is looking at this as a single cell. This is how, basically, the cells work uh, to basically maintain homeostasis. And you say, this is incredibly complex. And the answer, it is. It's complex and it's dynamic. But it's taking place in each of your 37 trillion cells, second by second, throughout the day. And if you maintain equilibrium, you maintain wellness. If somehow this metabolism is disrupted, you start the pathway toward developing chronic disease. Now, if this slide is complex, the control systems, the signaling systems that control metabolism in a cell are even more complex. Think of that black box as a single cell. And remember, you have 37 trillion of these. And 
you have very so-called control points, almost like nodes. They basically, as they're activated, they basically either turn on or turn off different factors that basically act as switches, master switches that maintain your metabolism. But let's focus on the one, the one key master switch, the master regulator. It's called AMPK. And this particular gene transcription factor is controlled under robust dietary control because it's the resolution response that basically activates AMPK to basically orchestrate these traffic signals in every cell in your body. And if that traffic signals are orchestrated correctly, it gives rise to an increased health span. Health span is defined as longevity minus years of disability. In America today, our health span is about 20 years less than our lifespan, which means that 20 years of life for most Americans are lived basically being disabled by conditions caused by chronic disease. Now here are some of the primary complications of insulin resistance. Think of this as a champagne fountain. Initially, uh, you have the empty glass at the top, but as you start increasing insulin resistance, it fills up and then spills over into the next tier. For most, the first chronic disease that appears is diabetes. But as that champagne levels fill up, they now spill over in the next tier, which is heart disease, and eventually into Alzheimer's. This is why that once you have insulin, once you have diabetes, you're twice as, four times as likely to get heart disease and twice as likely to get Alzheimer's. And that's why many neurologists describe Alzheimer's as diabetes type three. However, there's even more bad news because virtually every chronic disease state is associated with insulin resistance. It could be obesity, it could be diabetes, cardiovascular disease like hypertension, cancers, fatty liver disease, neuro diseases like, uh, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, depression, kidney disease, heart disease, and eventually frailty. Each of these is strongly associated with insulin resistance, which means each is strongly associated with a disrupted metabolism. That being said, how do you measure insulin resistance? Well, there's a very simple test first developed in 18, uh, 1986. It's called the homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance, or HOMA-IR. And you measure this by looking at the levels of the ratio of glucose to fasting insulin. Now, once you uh, get that, if your HOMA-IR is less than one, consider yourself well. It means your metabolism is working at peak efficiency. Between one and two, you're not well, but you're at least normal. You have no incidence of chronic disease. But by the time it reaches two, insulin resistance is now developing in every cell in your body. And as insulin resistance grows, so does the complications of that, which generate into chronic disease. Now, insulin resistance is epidemic in America. In 2002, more than 20 years ago, only 5% of Americans had a HOMA IR of less than one, which means 95% of Americans 20 years ago were not well by any stretch of the imagination. But in 2020, if we take out diabetics who have high levels of insulin resistance and therefore high levels of HOMA, the average HOMA IR of non-diabetic Americans was 2.7, a very high number, which means this is why that we are basically aging at a faster rate, even though we spend more on healthcare than any other country in the world. Now, with that as a background, how do you reduce it? You reduce it by activating the master switch metabolism in every cell called AMPK, because that now can orchestrate those signaling pathways that affect everything that basically we associate with chronic disease. It can turn down the production of cytokines and acosinoids. It can basically increase the production of mitochondria. It can reduce fatty acid synthesis. It can reduce the synthesis of cholesterol. It increases glucose uptake 
So everything that we associate with a better quality of life moves through this one node point in every one of your cells called AMPK. So that being said, what exactly is metabolic engineering? Metabolic engineering is a dietary program that allows you to reprogram your metabolism by activating AMPK in each of your 37 trillion cells. And here are the primary dietary activators that we can use to increase AMPK activity. The number one factor that works day in and day out is called calorie restriction. Calorie restriction is a direct activator of AMPK. And calorie restriction is the only proven technology that makes us live longer and live better. But that's not the only activator. Omega-3 fatty acids. These are the building blocks of those hormones we described earlier called resolvents. They basically not only turn off inflammation, but they too activate AMPK. And there are also polyphenols. These are the chemicals that give fruits and vegetables their color. And they do so by basically decreasing oxidation by activating another gene transcription factor called NRF2. But that also has an indirect effect of activating AMPK. So you have three distinct dietary interventions that can activate AMPK, and by doing so, reduce insulin resistance and improve one's health span. These are the three dietary components of metabolic engineering. The foundation is calorie restriction. You have to do this, but you have to do it without hunger or fatigue. You need adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. And you also need adequate levels of polyphenols in your diet. And when you have all three of these components of metabolic engineering, you are now positioned to change metabolic function in every cell in your body. But there are some basic questions. Relative to the polyphenols, which ones? There are 8,000 polyphenols. Which one's the best? And how much? Another question is, the omega-3 fatty acids, how much do I need? And finally, with calorie restriction, how do I stop hunger? Nobody is going to follow calorie restriction if they're hungry. So these are the questions we have to address to make metabolic engineering a reality. So let's first talk about polyphenols. We know they're associated with reduction of oxidative stress. They're vastly more powerful than antioxidant of compounds like vitamin C or vitamin E, maybe orders of magnitude, because basically they can base destroy free radicals over and over and over again by activating through that gene transcription factor, NRF2, a wide variety of antioxidative enzymes. Well, if you find them in fruits and vegetables, here are some of the problems. They're found in only very low concentrations. Maybe about one-tenth of a percent of the weight of a vegetable contains polyphenols. In fruits, it's higher, but only two-tenths of a percent of the weight of fruit contains polyphenols. So they're found in very low concentrations. Furthermore, which means you have to eat a lot, but you have another problem. They're not very well absorbed. If they don't get into the blood, they can't affect your metabolism. And finally, if they get into the blood, they leave the blood pretty quickly. Their half-life is about two hours, which means to maintain adequate levels of polyphenols, you should be consuming them three times a day. The key thing about polyphenols is they should help you live longer. This is a study done a decade ago in Italy on elderly Italians in the Tuscan, uh, Tuscan mountain region. So they're eating the old ways, the old Mediterranean diet. So they thought, say, we'll do food diaries and see who eats the most polyphenols, and they should live the longest. Well, the answer to that question was shown on graph B. There was no relation, none whatsoever, between the amount of polyphenols these people ate and when they died. This made no sense. So then the investigator said, perhaps it's not how much they're eating, but how much gets into the blood. 
Well, polyphenols are very hard to measure in the blood, but they have to leave the blood in the urine. So they now looked at urine samples. And now they found out exactly what they're looking for. Those elderly Italians who had the highest levels of polyphenol metabolites in their urine live 31% longer. No drug known in medical science can make that statement. But if you consume adequate levels of polyphenols and they get into the body, then they are very, very powerful agents to live longer and live better. Now, I said there are 8,000 polyphenols. Which ones? Well, one criteria, it should be the ones that are most likely to get into the blood. That rules out about 7,999. But there is one class of polyphenols that's very, very water-soluble. And these are called delphinidines. And if you put a, a small amount of a delphinidine concentrate into a glass of water, you get a picture that looks like this. In fact, it looks like almost like a glass of red wine. Not surprisingly, because delphinidines are one of the primary polyphenols found in red wine. So what if you can concentrate up these polyphenols, these delphinidines, and basically use them to affect humans? Because it's not saying animal studies, we're really looking at human studies. This is one published study looking at pre-diabetics who have elevated levels of um, glycosylated hemoglobin. And you can see within a very short period of time, within about 12 weeks, there's a significant reduction of glycosylated hemoglobin. This is the primary marker of saying whether you have or don't have diabetes. And more importantly, they reduce oxidative stress. This study, also done in Italy, they took smokers who generate oxidative stress simply by the amount of smoke <laughs> that they inhale on a daily basis. They didn't ask the smokers to stop smoking, but half got the delphinidines, and the other half said got a placebo. Then they looked at the primary marker of oxidative stress. And what they found within 30 days, it had dramatically reduced. That was statistically significant. And when the smokers stopped taking the polyphenols, they found the levels of the oxidative stress went right back up to what they were initially. Now, how do polyphenols actually work and how do they activate AMPK? It gets a little more complex. The polyphenols, if they get into the blood, will not activate AMPK directly. They'll activate a different set of uh, enzymes, they're called sirtuins, that now activate an upstream factor called LKB1 that now activates AMPK that does all its magical tricks. In addition, it makes now more NAD. It recycles NAD that basically is required by the sirtuins to keep the cycle going. So if you have enough polyphenols in the diet and maintaining adequate levels in the blood, you can maintain this virtuous cycle of AMPK activation over and over and over again. Now, what about high-dose omega-3 fatty acids? Why are they important? They are the drivers of resolution. They are the hormones that turn off inflammation in every cell in the body. We often think of inflammation from this kind of a pictorial, thinking of a raging fire that dies out the embers. It's a wonderful analogy. It simply isn't true. Yes, if you have inflammation, it will be attenuated below the perception of pain, but it's still ongoing, causing ongoing destruction. So how does inflammation really work? And what's the role of omega-3 fatty acids in its resolution? Well, first of all, these hormones called resolvents were only recently discovered at Harvard Medical School about 20 years ago. And these are now known to be the most powerful hormones known in the medical science, orders of magnitude more powerful than things such as estrogens or testosterone or growth hormone. But if you do not have adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood or in the cells, you cannot make these resolvents. That's why they're important. And these resolvents basically only last a few seconds. They do their job, they turn off inflammation, and then self-destruct. That's why you need adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids 
constantly in the blood to act as a reservoir to make these resolvins when called upon to turn off inflammation. And here's the time course of inflammation. Initially, there's a swelling, the redness, that's the edema, then followed by the pain as you get an infiltration of neutrophils into the damaged site, causing significant damage at the molecular level. And then the more, more powerful immune cells, the macrophages, now enter and keep on causing damage. But somehow, magically, somehow, these macrophages are transformed from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory to clear up all the damage. And what causes that transformation? The generation of resolvents. Now, how can you tell if you have adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet? Well, you look at the ratio of two fatty acids in the blood. One is the long-chain omega-6 fatty acid, arachidonic acid, which is the building block of all of the pro-inflammatory acosinoids. The other fatty acid is the long-chain omega-3 fatty acid, pentanoic acid, which is the building block of many of the hormones that basically turn off inflammation. You need some inflammation, but not too much. It's the dynamic balance of inflammation that allows us to maintain wellness. The question might be, how much do you need? It depends. Let's say you're well. You're well that you have no chronic disease and you look good in a swimsuit. You might need two and a half grams of omega-3 fatty acids to maintain that balance. But what if you're not so well? What if you're obese? You have diabetes or heart disease. All diseases associated with insulin resistance. You'll need higher levels. And what if you now have chronic pain, like the pain with uh, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or the pain coming from cancer? the levels are higher. And what if the inflammation is inside the brain? You have a neurological disease. It might be depression, anxiety, ADHD, multiple sclerosis. The levels you need to maintain that ratio are even greater. Make no mistake about it, these are high levels, but they're also therapeutic levels. Because at levels below this, you will not get the benefits of turning off inflammation in different organs in your body. Now, that's a recommendation, but testing is always better than guessing. The beauty of using this blood test, you need only a finger stick of blood to measure the ratio of these two fatty acids. There's a target zone. You'd like it to be between 1.5 and 3. That's where you want to be. But as the ratio increases, your levels of inflammation throughout the body is also increasing. And you go from good to moderate bad to very bad. Now that occurs, anything above 15 is really bad. The average American is about 20, which explains now the reason why our healthcare costs are so great. But you can bring it down very quickly into that target zone and because we can now individualize the amount of omega-3 fatty acids one needs to do that. Now, taking supplements like a polyphenol extracts and omega-3 fatty acids, that's easy. Changing your dietary habits, that's hard. But that's the key, for the underlying key for metabolic engineering. And here's the reason why. Think of your body as a large bucket with holes. You can add the best supplements, the polyphenols or the omega-3 fatty acids, to that big bucket. But if the bucket has holes, many of the benefits of those supplements are now basically lost. So what calorie restriction does, it blocks the holes in the big bucket. It now it makes those supplements work far more effectively in terms of reducing inflammation and basically improving your metabolism. So what are some of the dietary inhibitors of AMPK activity? There's some direct inhibitors, such as excess calories or excess glucose. There are indirect inhibitors, such as ex excess fructose and excess protein. So you can see from this graph, you have to basically maintain a more of a balance of calories, not too many, but not too low, 
decreased the amount of simple sugars, fructose and glucose, and some protein, not too much, but not too less. So, but the key factor is how do I achieve lifetime calorie restriction without hunger? Because if that's not achieved, no one will ever fall calorie restriction on a lifetime basis. <laughs> well, here are your three options. Option number one, gastric bypass surgery. It works. It's a little brutal, but it works. Option number two, injectable drugs. These are the new weight loss drugs, things like Ozempic or Wagovi. These drugs will basically shut down appetite in the brain. But they must be taken for a lifetime. The day you stop taking these injectable drugs, the weight begins to reaccumulate. But more importantly, they are very crude drugs because you're typically not eating. And therefore, 40% of your weight loss is not, uh, not fat. It's mainly made up of lean body mass. You're losing mass from your heart, your kidney, your liver, your brain, your heart. This does not give rise to good long-term prospects for wellness. Your third option is metabolic engineering. And the key factor of metabolic engineering is really following the zone diet. The Zone Diet was not a diet to lose weight. It was patented as a drug to reduce insulin resistance. And how does the Zone Diet work? It reduces insulin resistance by balancing the protein to glycemic load in your diet at every meal. And it says ratio of protein to the glycemic load is like a carburetor of a car. Uh, you can't run your car all on gas you can't run it all in air. You need some combination for the best mileage of the car. Your metabolism is no different. You can't eat only protein. You can't eat only carbohydrates. You need a balance to maintain the efficiency of your metabolism. So what happens when you eat a high carbohydrate diet? You're consuming excess dietary glucose and that decreases AMPK activity. And that gives rise to insulin resistance. Well, the obvious solution is eat no carbohydrates at all. Eat a ketogenic diet. Now you have deficit amounts of glucose coming to the body. And the brain is a glucose hog. It needs tremendous amounts of glucose to maintain itself. So what happens, you will now the body will increase the secretion of cortisol to break down muscle mass to convert it into glucose. It's called you know, glucose genesis. And the trouble with that is cortisol increases insulin resistance. So between those two extremes lies the zone. You need a balance of insulin. Not too high, but not too low. And if you can maintain that balance, you reduce insulin resistance. So that's what the zone diet is. It's not a diet to lose weight. It's an AMPK activating diet. Yes, it is calorie restricted, but one without hunger or fatigue because you're never being hungry because you're getting adequate protein to generate signals from the gut to the brain saying, stop eating. It's moderate in low glycemic load carbohydrates. What are those? They're primarily non-starchy vegetables. It's low in fat, but it's rich in fermentable fiber because it's the fiber in the diet that's metabolized by the gut that amplifies the hormonal signals generated by protein to further keep appetite under control. This is how you can now follow a calorie-restricted diet for a lifetime because you aren't hungry. Here are the basics of the zone diet. You need about 30 grams of protein at every meal to create satiety. Now, if 30 grams of protein is good, more should be better. Not exactly, because more protein actually increases insulin resistance. So those 30 grams of protein at every meal you want to balance by about 40 grams of fiber-rich, low-glycemic, low-carbohydrates at every meal. Non-starchy vegetables are the best, and primarily the ABCs, things like asparagus, artichoke hearts, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflowers, and spinach. And how much? Eat as much as you can because it's hard to overconsume the ABCs. And finally, you add a dash a monounsaturated fat to every meal. That's it. 
And for the next five hours, what you create is a hormonal environment that basically reduces insulin resistance. Now, is there any data to support that contention? This is studies done at Harvard Medical School uh, in 1999. They brought in obese children from Boston on three separate occasions. And, and they'd have them stay overnight, have them wake up in the morning, and put catheters in their arms, and then give them meals of equal number of calories, about 400 calories, but different compositions. One meal might be a high carbohydrate glycemic uh, load meal, like a typical breakfast cereal. Another one would be a high carbohydrate but lower glycemic load meal, like oatmeal. But the third meal was basically a zone meal, composed of more protein, of egg whites, with vegetables, an egg white vegetable omelet. Then they looked at the hormones. They looked at the hormone insulin. And you can see, even though the meals had equal number of calories, the insulin response was dramatically different. The high carbohydrate meals, insulin rose quickly and fell off very quickly. But on the zone meal, it didn't rise very high and rose, dropped off very slowly. But they also looked at other hormones like glucagon. Notice in the high carbohydrate meals, glucagon was depressed for the five hours after the meal. But for those who got the zone meal, it was actually elevated. Why is this important? Because glucagon is there to maintain and stabilize blood sugar levels. Insulin reduces blood sugar, glucagon raises blood sugar. You want to maintain stable blood sugar, you need both these hormones working in concert. Now, what they did to these children after the first five hours was to take the catheters out of their arm and then give them exactly the same meal they had for breakfast for lunch. Then they brought them into a conference room uh, with things such as TVs to watch or comic books to read and a buffet of all the things that you know, uh, obese children like to eat. Cookies, donuts, uh, biscuits, whatever it might be. And say, if you're hungry in the next five hours, be, help yourself to the buffet. But in the meantime, the Harvard investigators were keeping very careful details of what the children ate. And what they found that the obese children who basically had two zone meals back to back ate 46% less, fewer calories. No behavioral modification, no exercise program. They simply weren't hungry. Well, that's fine for one day in the zone. But can it lower insulin resistance? This is another study published in 1998 looking taking at obese individuals or type 2 diabetics and saying, well, if we give them a zone diet at every meal for 30 days, what's happened? Well, you can see that the obese patients had fairly high levels of HOMA IR, but the diabetics had much higher. And yet within four days of following the zone diet, the levels of insulin resistance had dropped dramatically in both groups before they had lost any weight. And by day 28, they had lost a little more weight, but most of it the most of the effect on insulin resistance had occurred very, very quickly. Now, we hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet. Well, we have, do we have any studies that compares the zone diet to the Mediterranean diet? Yes, we do, <laughs> under controlled feeding conditions. This is a crossover study. Both diets were calorie restricted to exactly the same extent. But the zone diet had a far greater reduction of the HOMA IR than the Mediterranean diet. It also had a far greater reduction in the glycemic variability, the swings of blood sugar, than the Mediterranean diet. This is why you do studies. They say, say science tells us which direction we should move in. Now, that's fine about the zone diet. What have you ha happened to add high dose fish oil to the zone diet? Now we have the foundation of metabolic engineering. We're going to add now high dose fish oil and see what the effect might be. No matter how fat you are, you'll never be as fat as Manuel Ribi. Uh, Manuel Ribi is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the fattest man in the history of the world. Uh, he weighed 560 kilograms. We started working with Manuel uh, early after this uh, magazine was um, published. And how do we do that? We gave them high dose fish oil, about 10 grams a day of omega-3 fatty acids, and every meal was his own meal. 
because he couldn't leave his bed, obviously, but his mother would make the meals and bring it to his bedside. So 18 months after doing this, here's Manuel. He's still grossly obese. Even though he's lost 18% of his body fat, he's lost, he's now only, only down to 400 kilograms. They say, but he's not healthy, he's not well. Let's look at his blood. There's his total cholesterol, perfectly normal. Blood pressure, perfectly normal. Blood glucose, perfectly normal. Heart rate, perfectly normal. So we had changed his metabolism. The weight loss, we slower. There's Manuel, another uh, three years, on his wedding night. He's now down to 325 kilograms. He's now lost 42% of his total weight. Only one person in the world has ever lost more weight than Manuel Arrivi. Now you can see he's still uh, you know, overweight. Uh, he still had, you know, but the fact is, he's at this point has lost a massive amount of weight by combining using just now the zone diet plus the high dose of omega-3 fatty acids. So if we want to reduce insulin resistance, we need an integrated dietary approach. We need the zone diet. That's the foundation. You have to add omega-3 fatty acids. How much? The blood will tell you. And we have to add polyphenols. Now, we do not have these when we're working with Manuel Reedy, but these add another layer of benefits to basically metabolic engineering. And if all three of these are working together, you get into what I call a region of the zone. The zone is when your metabolism is working at peak efficiency. Now, we can define this a little more medically. It's retaking control of your metabolism by reducing insulin resistance. So we can define the zone as maintaining HOMA IR less than one, because that means we're optimizing AMPK activity. And optimizing AMPK activity leads to the slowing of the aging process. But you need a roadmap because everyone is somewhat genetically different. So now let's go at how do we personalize these dietary components of metabolic engineering. The zone diet is pretty straightforward. We talked about adequate protein in every meal, a lot of vegetables, and some monounsaturated fat. But how much of the omega-3 fatty acids do I need? Or how much of the delphinidines do I need? Well, that's why we have blood markers. The ratio of triglycerides to HDL should be less than one. This is most affected by the zone diet. So by looking at this ratio of triglycerides to HDL, one can ascertain if the person needs more work on following the zone diet. The ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA should be between 1.5 and 3. This is most affected by the omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. And your glycosylated hemoglobin should be between 4.9 and 5.1%. This is most affected by the polyphenols. So by using these additional blood markers, we can decide which of the three components of metabolic engineering needs more work to bring the patient into the zone where basically his metabolism is now becoming more and more efficient. But the benefits of metabolic injuring are far more powerful than you might think. Yes, the goal is the reduction of dietary insulin, insulin resistance. However, as you go deeper into metabolism, we're also causing epigenetic changes. We're reprogramming the expression of our genes, and that allows us to remove senescent cells. This is the underlying cause of the aging process. Cells become senescent. They don't uh, become cancerous, but they basically no longer divide. But they become inflammatory centers. And it's the inflammation caused by senescent cells that really drives the aging process. And keep in mind, genes are static. We talk about genetic engineering. Well, Genes don't do much. It's the epigenetics that makes them dynamic, that turns genes on and turns genes off. And why is this important? Because at any time, only maybe 5 to 10% of your genes are active in the cell. 
And these activity of these genes are controlled by gene transcription factors. And the activity of those gene transcription factors is controlled by A and BK. So the more you can control A and BK, you begin to control which genes are turned on and turned off in every one of your 37 trillion cells. That's a pretty impressive process, but it's all done by the diet. And we also know that ANPK activation is the key for epigenetics. It controls epigenetic signaling. It activates one of the key uh, enzymes called uh, 1011 2 that uh, is now the TET2, that turns genes on and turns genes off. But you can control ANPK by metabolic engineering and keep it under control for a lifetime. Now, if the goal is staying cell, you have to kill the zombie cells. Zombie cells is really a scientific term used to describe senescent cells. You have to destroy them like a cancer cell and replace them with new healthy cells. That's the power of metabolic engineering. Because the diseases, chronic diseases driven by cellular senescence are virtually the same diseases associated with insulin resistance. And therefore, anything that reduces insulin resistance basically is more likely reducing cellular senescence. Do we have any information on uh, support for that? <laughs> well, we do from animal studies that basically we can take uh, animals, rats, <coughs> and put them on either a high fat diet or low fat diet. On a low fat diet, the number of their weight decreases or it's not as high. A high fat diet, they get fat. But you can also yo yo them back and forth. Put them on a start on a low fat diet, go to a high fat, cycle back, and basically cycle their weight back and forth. Their overall weight gain is intermediate between always being on a high fat diet or always being on a low fat diet. So, what are the benefits of basically reducing body fat on reducing the levels of senescent cells? It turns out the more you basically reduce body fat, senescent cells begin to disappear because the you're now increasing AMPK. If AMPK is inhibited, then all the pillars of aging are linked to this. So the key, if we want to live longer and live better, we have to activate AMPK in each of the 37 trillion cells. And the key thing is cellular senescence accelerates insulin resistance. It causes increased generation of internal inflammation. It induces a positive feedback loop for insulin resistance. It speeds up the development of chronic diseases by affecting each of those pillars of aging. And this is how chronic disease actually develops. Initially, you're healthy, but if you're eating a pro-inflammatory diet, you're being in inhibiting AMPK. This gives rise to insulin resistance. That we can measure. We can't measure AMPK because it's inside the cell, but we can measure insulin resistance outside the cell. That's why it's in green. And insulin resistance causes cellular stress, like oxidative stress. And that causes DNA damage, which causes cellular senescence, and that speeds up insulin resistance. But you can, it's very hard to measure cellular uh, senescence. And it's also hard to measure their early organ damage, the seven pillars of aging. But eventually they give rise to our first clinical observation we can measure many years after this increasing level of insulin resistance. And this usually leads to lifetime drug use to manage the organ damage, and that leads to reduced health span. So what you want to do is to basically, by activating AMPK, decrease, if not reverse, cellular senescence, which is really at the molecular level the driving cause of aging. So in summary, hormonal replacement therapy or any drug will always work better when combined with metabolic engineering. But the use of metabolic engineering allows better therapeutic results with lower levels of hormone replacement or any drug. Thank you very much.